Thank you very much for having me. This is the first time that I've gotten to visit UCLA, although I've been to LA a few times. So it's really nice for me to get to be here and to get to talk to you uh, about my work today. So the main interest in all of my research is um, how we make sense of other people's behavior, whether it be their verbal behavior or their nonverbal behavior. And because humans are fundamentally social creatures, this is something that we have to do all the time, right? We spend the vast majority of our lives interacting with others. And during those interactions, we need to be able to interpret other people's behavior, predict what they might do next, or in some ma cases, maybe manipulate their behavior, cause them to behave in a particular way. As adults, we're reasonably good at this. So if I show you an image like this one and asked you, why is this person doing what she's doing? You could probably pretty easily come up with a number of possible explanations for her behavior, right? So perhaps uh, she just likes running and so she's running for fun. Maybe she wants to lose weight and she thinks that that's a good way to do it and so that's why she's running. Um, one of my graduate students offered the helpful suggestion that perhaps there's a T-Rex off to the side there um, and she knows this and we don't and so she's running for her life and maybe we should follow suit, okay? So in generating these different explanations, what I want you to note is that we use mental states when we're generating these explanations. So things like, she likes running, that's her preference. Her goal is to lose weight and she believes that this is a good way to do it or she knows that there is a monster and we don't know that. So as adults, we routinely invoke these unobservable mental states in order to be able to explain other people's behavior and we do it quite easily most of the time. Uh, this capacity to interpret behavior in terms of mental states has been known by lots of different names, things like mind reading, mentalizing, theory of mind. In this talk today, I'll be referring to it as psychological reasoning, so our ability to reason about other people's psychology, what's going on in their heads. So given the sort of ubiquitous nature of this phenomenon, there's a lot of research in developmental psychology that's aimed at understanding the origins of this ability. And so that's the focus of my work. I wanna know first, what are the cognitive mechanisms that allow us to do this, to engage in psychological reasoning? And second, when and how do these mechanisms develop over the course of childhood? And I, like a number of other researchers, assume that infants possess a psychological reasoning system that consists of a basic skeletal causal framework that allows them to interpret and predict the actions of agents and also to learn about the actions of agents. And it's assumed that this causal framework operates largely outside of conscious awareness, at least initially, and it provides them with some very simple concepts that will help them to reason about behavior. So for instance, there's now been a considerable body of work suggesting that by around three months of age, infants are capable of reasoning about the behavior of other individuals in terms of their motivational states, so their goals and their preferences. Okay. There's also work suggesting that by six months, they're able to take into account another individual's epistemic states, so what they do or do not know, what they have or have not seen. Okay. And finally, there's some evidence that uh, from at least six months of age, this system contains a basic principle of rationality, which basically means the infants expect individuals to go about pursuing their goals in a reasonably efficient way, given what they know about their environment. One thing though that's been missing from a lot of this work that's been done over the course of the last 20 years is what happens in cases where someone is not just unknowledgeable, but is actually mistaken about the world around them. So we refer to this as counterfactual states when someone believes something that we know to be false. And we want to know when children understand that other individuals can be mistaken. When are they able to do this kind of thing? This question has been subject to a vast amount of research over the course of the last 30 to 40 years. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is for a long time, uh, the ability to understand false beliefs was seen as sort of a litmus test for this ability to reason about other people's minds because it requires you to recognize that someone else has a different mental state from your own, right? That's necessary to understand that someone is mistaken. But false belief understanding, I think, is also very interesting in its own right. It's been argued to be foundational to a number of fundamental um, human social behaviors like cooperation, communication, and learning. You have to be able to understand that other people might have representations of the world that are really very different from your own when you're interacting with them in these social contexts. Okay? 
So when does this ability to attribute false beliefs to others develop? There have been a large number of studies on this question over the course of the last several decades that used what I refer to as elicited response tasks. And these are called elicited response tasks because the experimenter explicitly requests a response from the child. They ask them to directly explain or predict the behavior of someone who holds a false belief. And I'm going to give you a very sort of classic example that you may be familiar with, um, known as the Sally Ann task. So here, children see a little story acted out with puppets or dolls in which Sally has an object, in this case a marble, that she hides in one location and then she goes outside to play. While she's gone, her friend Anne comes in and moves the object to the other location, to a nearby box. And then Sally comes back and children are asked, where will Sally look for her marble? In order to answer this question correctly, you have to recognize that Sally doesn't know that the marble was moved, that it's in the basket. And so adults will say, oh, she's going to look in the basket because she has a false belief about the marble's location. Children typically begin to pass this kind of task at around age four. So starting at around age four, they'll say, yes, she's going to look in the basket. Younger children uh, fail by saying that she's going to look in the box where the marble is actually located. And this has been widely replicated time and time again with many different kinds of tasks, leading people to say that this ability to understand Sally's false belief just wasn't present until at least age four. And there's some cross-cultural differences in this. So some, in some cultures, children pass at later ages. So that's why I'm saying at least age four. That's the earliest that this ability emerges. Now, you can see from these citations up here that these early findings were from the early 80s. And from the very get-go, there were some people who challenged this conclusion that this ability didn't emerge until at least age four. They said, this task is very complicated. It's very verbal. There's a lot of stuff going on. Perhaps it's underestimating children's understanding of other people's behavior. They also pointed to anecdotal evidence of younger children appearing right, to be sensitive, trying to deceive siblings and things like this, and suggested maybe there's some understanding of false belief well before this age. But despite that, those arguments, there wasn't a lot of evidence to back it up. Attempts to show that children understood this at younger ages were largely unsuccessful, unsuccessful for a long time. And so the conclusion stood. This changed in 2005 when a very famous paper by Onishi and Bayerjean was published. And what they decided to do was to try to make this task as simple as possible, to strip away a lot of the demands imposed on children and see if you can see false belief understanding at a much younger age. So they used what I'll refer to as a spontaneous response false belief task. And these tasks differ in that children are not asked any direct questions. Right? We just measure their spontaneous responses to a scene and use those spontaneous responses to infer their understanding of another individual's mental states. In this particular case, they used a task that I'm going to be talking about in some of my own studies, known as a violation of expectation task. And the idea behind these tasks is that children have a tendency to look longer at things that violate their expectations about the world. So you can show them pairs of events, one that they would find expected if they had adult-like reasoning, and one that they would find unexpected, and see if you see a difference in looking time to those two events. So in this particular case, they basically made a violation of expectation version of the Sally Ann task that I just showed you a minute ago. Um, children watched scenes like this. So there's a person who has two locations. She has a toy watermelon. I've sort of skipped a lot of the backstory for time, but she has a toy watermelon that she's just hidden in this green location. Right? While she's out of the room, the watermelon sneaks over and hides in the yellow box. And then she comes back. And in the test trial, infants see one of these two things. They either see her reach into the green box or they see her reach into the yellow box and pause. And then infants looking time to these two paused scenes is measured. And what they found was that at 15 months of age, infants looked significantly longer when she reached into the yellow box, suggesting that they realized she had not seen the watermelon move. She should believe that it's in the green box, so she should reach here and they looked longer when she reached into the yellow box instead because they found that unexpected. And I'm just telling you about one condition here. They had a number of other versions to sort of nail this down, but in all of the conditions that they ran, 
Infants expected her to act based on her false belief and looked longer if she did otherwise. And based on that, they concluded that false belief understanding is present well before age four. It's present by at least 15 months of age. This study triggered a landslide of research into early false belief understanding. Someone has a very fun graph that they've put together of the use of the term theory of mind in Google Scholar citations, and you see this enormous explosion um, at 2005, where it triggered this real landslide of research. And so since this study came out, um, there's been over two dozen studies that have reported evidence of false belief understanding in children as young as six months of age. They've used a lot of different methods. So some use these looking time methods like what I just described to you. Others look at sort of more active behavioral things. So can children consider someone's false belief when they need to help another individual? Uh, Enrica Mall has developed a clever paradigm where she measures children's facial expressions to see if they signal any awareness in their facial expressions to someone's false belief. And there's been several recent very cool studies measuring neurological activity. This is where the six-month-old data is, which so still just measuring their neurological responses and seeing evidence that they appear to be representing someone else's false belief. As many empirical studies as there are, there's been at least three times as many th theoretical papers that have been written arguing about this because these findings have raised a lot of questions about the origins and development of false belief understanding. And so I'm going to talk today about just two of these questions that I've been studying over the course of the last 10 years or so. So the first question that I'm going to talk about is what is the nature of the understanding that we see in these infants and toddlers in these tasks? And the second one is why is it that children fail those Sally Ann type tasks until at least age four? So how do we sort of reconcile these two sets of findings? Starting with this first question, there are lots of questions you could ask about the nature of early competence, but one that has gotten a lot of attention is do we believe that this ability that is measured in these tasks with infants and toddlers is actually false belief understanding? Is this really demonstrating a capacity in these infants to represent other individuals' false beliefs? Or could it be some sort of more rudimentary ability that they're using instead? And so people have offered a number of more primitive rudimentary explanations. So one is that perhaps children learn via their experience with other individuals sets of behavioral rules for what people are likely to do in, in everyday circumstances, like they're going to look for things where they last saw them. And this would allow them to succeed in those kinds of tasks without representing someone's false belief. Another explanation is that maybe it has to do with low-level perceptual properties of the stimuli. So perhaps the thing that's unexpected is also more visually interesting for one reason or another, given the experiment. And so that may be why children look longer. Okay. So one approach to addressing uh, these questions of whether it's really false belief understanding or not is to examine the range of circumstances in which we see this ability. And in particular, in a commentary on the original Onishi and Bayerjean study, several people pointed out that when we look at four-year-olds, right, they're not just succeeding in one task. They understand lots of different kinds of false beliefs. They succeed in lots of different situations. They're able to predict a lot of different things that someone's going to do based on their false belief. And this really lends some credibility to the notion that they actually understand false belief because they have those robust, coherent understanding. And that means it's probably not some behavioral rule right, that, they're, that they're using. And so if we take this down to the, the babies, we could ask, do infants and toddlers also demonstrate a robust, flexible understanding of belief? If they do, it seems more convincing that they really represent beliefs as opposed to having one of these more primitive, rudimentary abilities. So this is something that uh, I studied a lot in my early work on this topic. So particularly looking at the kinds of false beliefs that infants and toddlers can understand. So I have a number of studies showing that they understand false beliefs about the location of an object, uh, the identity of an object. So things like understanding that Clark Kent is actually Superman and someone might not know that and have a false belief about it. Understanding uh, false beliefs about the non-obvious properties of an object. So you think that something rattles when in fact it does not. And these have all been replicated by other individuals and extended to other kinds of false beliefs, such as false beliefs about the presence of an object or the contents of an object. So you think that a crayon box has crayons and it actually has cereal in it. 
So this suggests that infants and toddlers can reason about a variety of different false beliefs, but all of this early research really focused on a very narrow range of responses that the, the mistaken individual is producing. Basically, are they going to reach here? Or are they going to reach there? And if it's really robust understanding of false belief, like what you and I would use in everyday circumstances, you should be able to understand a lot more about it as opposed to just where somebody is going to reach. And so in some more recent research, I've tried to look at whether children can go beyond just this basic physical action to some more interesting aspects of false belief understanding. So in the first project I'm going to tell you about, we looked at deception. So do infants understand how one individual might cause somebody else to hold a false belief? And in the second one, we looked at a different kind of response. So they understand how a mistaken agent might respond emotionally when they discover that they're mistaking. For each of these, um, these are part of larger projects. I'm just going to tell you about a single sort of representative experiment, but I'm happy in the question period to answer questions about other things that we've done uh, on these topics. So in this first experiment, this is work that I did in collaboration with Josh Richman and René Bayargent at the University of Illinois where we asked whether 17-month-olds understood how one person might go about causing someone else to hold a false belief. And we used a circumstance we thought that infants might be able to understand, which is if you want to steal another person's toy without getting caught, how should you go about doing it? Okay. So we tested 36 infants in a violation of expectation task. We had a two-by-two two design, so two conditions and two test events. And I'm going to sort of walk you through the setup for these different conditions. Here's our basic layout. So this is a live event that infants watch unfold on a puppet stage. Okay? And in all of the events that they see, there are two individuals. This person at the back I'll refer to as the thief. She's the one that's going to be try to be stealing. And this is the owner. And so infants see a series of trials involving these two individuals. In each trial, this person shows up with a toy on a tray, and then she shakes it. And sometimes it rattles, and sometimes it does not. I use this sort of rattling thing in lots of my work with infants because it turns out cross-culturally babies love rattling stuff. And so they will pay a lot of attention and be very interested in what somebody's going to do with this rattling object. Okay? So they see interactions between these two individuals. Sometimes this toy rattles and sometimes it does not. So in the case where it rattles, these rattling toy familiarization trials, this is sort of the schematic of how things unfold. And um, we have our thief here. The owner knocks and then enters with her toy. She rattles it. Okay? And then a bell rings behind her, and she says, oh, I have to go. She puts her toy down and closes the door and leaves. While she's gone, the thief rattles this, shakes the toy, and it rattles. And then she hears the owner returning and very quickly puts the toy down so that the owner doesn't catch her playing with the toy. Okay? The owner then comes back and places the toy in this treasure box here, and then the scene is paused. And so infants see three scenes that go like this. The silent toy trials are very similar, except that this toy here doesn't make any noise when it's rattled. And while the owner is gone, the thief completely ignores it. She's not interested in silent toys at all. And when the owner comes back, she tosses the toy out in a trash can that's across the stage. Okay. So the purpose of these six trials was to show the infants that there are two kinds of toys here, right? There's rattling toys and silent toys. The thief really likes the rattling toys. She wants to play with them, but she only wants to do this without the owner's knowledge. So for some reason, she doesn't want the owner to see her playing with those toys. It's very surreptitious. So they see three trials of each type. I'm just showing here what the toys actually looked like. You can see there's three noisy, three silent. The important thing I want you to notice is that by the end of these six trials, there's a yellow can in the garbage, and there's a green can in the garbage, okay, a silent of each of these. Infants then see one test trial that varies okay, across uh, conditions. So I'm going to show you the deception condition first. Starts just like before, where the owner shows up. She shakes her toy. It rattles. And then a bell rings, and she leaves. But you notice there's sort of a happy circumstance here where this rattling toy looks the same as one of the silent toys that was thrown away in the trash can earlier. And so the thief decides to take advantage of this. She picks up the rattling toy in one hand and reaches into the garbage can with the other. And then some infants see her pull out the green silent toy and place it here. And some infants see her pull out the yellow silent toy and place it there. 
In each case, she puts, this is the silent toy, she puts that there, she puts the noisy toy in her pocket, and then she pauses, and we measure infant's looking time to these paused scenes. The reasoning was that if infants realize what she's up to here, right, that she's trying to deceive, steal the toy without getting caught, then the only way she's going to be able to do that is if she replaces the green toy with a matching green toy. If she replaces it with a yellow one, then that's not going to fool anybody. As soon as the owner comes back, she's going to notice. And so they, if they understand her attempt at deception, they should expect this and they should look longer if they see the non-matching event instead. Now we also had a control condition to rule out things like that they just look longer at non-matching things. Right? I should mention that the color is counterbalanced. For half the infants, it's yellow to yellow, and for half, it's green to green. Right? So we had a silent control condition that's exactly the same as what I just described to you, except the toy the owner brings in is silent. And there's lots of research suggesting that if infants are unable to understand your motivation, they have no expectations about what you're going to do next. She had no interest in silent toys before, so if she suddenly reaches for one, it's going to be unclear what it is she's trying to achieve. And so infants should have no expectation about what toys she'll put back and look equally uh, at the two events. And so here are our results. I'm showing you the mean looking time in seconds to each uh, event separately by trial type and condition. And you can see that in the deception condition, infants expected her to replace the green toy with a matching green toy and looked significantly longer if they received the non-matching event instead. Whereas we see no effect in the silent control condition. So when they didn't understand the thief's motivation, they looked equally at the two events, suggesting that this effect is not just to do through some expectation that green will go with green or something like that. Okay. So I said we have a number of different um, experiments in this project, but taken together, what they suggest is that by 17 months, infants understand how the thief could go about this act of deception, how she could steal the owner's toy and get away with it, suggesting that there's some understanding of deception present already by the second year of life. Now, as I was doing this project, I was sort of struck. I was imagining, imagine you're the owner, and you come back, and you pick up your toy that was rattling when you were here last, and you shake it, and it doesn't make a sound. I was curious, would infants understand what you would do next? Like how you would respond as the infant, uh, as the owner when you've just been deceived. And so that led to this second project that I'm going to talk about. Can they reason about your emotional responses in these kinds of circumstances? When you discover that you're mistaken about something, how should you respond emotionally? And there are a number of ways that that owner could respond. She could be angry. Right? What did you do to my toy? She could be sad because her toy is broken. But one thing that she should be is surprised because the world is not consistent with the expectation that she had when she walked in. And so there's been work suggesting that older children realize that agents express surprise when they discover that their beliefs about a situation are false, but not when they hold true beliefs or when they just don't have any expectations at all. So if she had no knowledge of that toy, she didn't know what it was going to be like, it shouldn't be surprising whether it rattles or not. Mm -hmm. So in this project, as a sort of a follow-up, I looked at whether infants understood this relationship between her false beliefs and her emotions. So do they expect um, an agent to be surprised when she discovered that she held a false belief? What was slightly older infants for this one, so it's sort of like a next step down the inference, and wanted to see, make sure that they would be able to do that reasoning. So uh, we tested, in this particular experiment, it's 28, 20-month-olds. Again, it's violation of expectation. A little different from the last one, so the last one was live uh, interactions. Here we used videotaped events because it was very important that the emotional expressions that infants saw were identical uh, across infants, and that's very hard to do if you have a bunch of different undergraduates um, acting out your paradigms. So this is all videotaped stimuli with a very similar sort of design, and I'm going to talk about the false belief condition first. So all of the infants initially saw a familiarization trial where we have an agent and she has two cups here and two lids and some marbles. The first thing that she does is she converts these cups into rattles. So again, with the rattling objects, she puts three marbles in each one, puts the lid on, and then she shakes each of them to demonstrate that they produce a rattling noise. And she shakes them in turn uh, until infants look away so they can look as long at this rattling as they want. In the next familiarization trial, she's gone. 
and a new guy shows up, and he acts on one of the objects. Which one he acts on is counterbalanced. But so here he empties, uh, he takes the lid off the red object and pours the marbles out, places them in this tray, which he's going to take away with him. So he's stealing the marbles from this red object. He then shakes them in turn, showing that the red one no longer produces a rattling sound, and the green one still produces a rattling sound. And he does this again in alternation until infants look away. All infants then see a single test trial. So our agent, initial agent, has returned. Scene looks just like when she left it. And in this particular experiment that I'm telling about, she always reaches for the silent object. So in this version, that would be red, though it's counterbalanced across infants. So she reaches for the silent object. She shakes it. It doesn't make a noise. And then she's either surprised by the fact that it is silent or she is not surprised. So here she's just making sort of a hmm, totally nonplussed, not particularly interested in the outcome of this event. Okay. So if infants, like older children, expect people to be surprised when they discover that they're mistaken, then they should expect her to look like this, and they should look longer if instead she is totally underwhelmed by what just occurred. Now, the ignorance condition was designed to rule out a number of low-level explanations of this, which it could be that babies just think people are surprised by silent stuff for no particular reason, right? There's lots of things like that. So in the ignorance condition, things unfold very similarly, um, except for a key difference in the second familiarization trial, which is that you see the white tray that was over here before is gone. And so when this agent empties the red cup, he places the marbles back on this tray in the middle of the table. So when agent one returns in the test trial, she'll be able to see them. Right? Otherwise, everything that he does is exactly the same. Right? So when she comes back, this is very subtle. The only difference is that there's three marbles right there. So she can see that someone has been messing with her stuff while she's gone. They've taken the marbles out of one of the objects. She doesn't know which one has been manipulated. So that's why it's the ignorance condition. She's ignorant about which cup is noisy and which cup is silent. Okay. So here, adults, uh, typically, if you don't have any expectation about what will happen, there's no reason for you to be surprised regardless of what you discover. So if infants understand that, then she should not be surprised when she shakes the silent object, and this would be the expected event. So we should get a reversal if they understand this relationship. Okay. All right, and so here are the results for this one. This is the mean looking time in seconds, again, to the two events separately by condition. And you can see that infants in the false belief condition expected her to be surprised when she discovered that she held a false belief. And they looked significantly longer if she was not surprised. And the opposite occurred in the ignorance condition. So they realized she had no reason to be surprised because she was merely ignorant. And they looked longer uh, if she was surprised. And we also have another experiment in this paper where we compare a false belief to true belief. So if you're knowledgeable, you also shouldn't be surprised, right? Because the world is consistent with your expectations and you see a very similar pattern where infants don't expect you to be surprised if you know, they only expect you to be surprised if you hold a false belief. Right? So this suggests that infants understand the causal relationship between belief and surprise and can use that to predict how someone will respond emotionally when they discover that they are mistaken. And taken together with a variety of other recent findings, these suggest that by 20 months of age at least, infants can reason about a mistaken agent's physical actions, so where she's going to reach, her emotional responses, like I've just showed you, and her verbal utterances, so their ability to take a false belief into account when interpreting what someone just said to them. So altogether now, together with other recent findings, these two projects uh, show that Toddlers, infants and toddlers do possess a robust, flexible understanding of belief. They succeed in many different kinds of tasks. They can reason about a wide range of false beliefs and belief-inducing situations. They can pre predict and interpret a variety of belief-based responses. And also in some research that I did with Clark as part of the Culture and Mind Project, we found that this ability emerges in infancy across diverse cultures. Okay. And 
this sort of, the, the jury is not out on that question, that, that they're still out on the question I started with of whether this is really false belief. This is an argument that's ongoing, okay? But I will point out that in every case where someone has offered a specific alternative, testable alternative hypothesis, it's been immediately refuted in the next you know, subsequent paper that has been published. And so while there's still a lot of work to do here and the argument isn't over, the accumulating evidence really suggests that toddlers and infants are in fact representing other individuals' false beliefs. And so that brings us back to this second question. If this really is false belief understanding at six months of age, as suggested by the research that I've been talking about, then why on earth do children fail those Sally Ann type tasks until age four? How do we reconcile this apparent knowledge at a very young age with failure until early school years, which in my line of work is like ancient, right? Why is it taking them so long to pass this? Um, and my colleagues and I have described what we refer to as a processing load account, which basically just makes the point that there's a distinction here between competence and performance. The fact that you can represent a false belief does not necessarily mean that you're going to succeed in reasoning about someone's actions in any given task or real life situation for that matter. So we've argued that performance in these different situations depends not just on your ability to represent, but on the demands that are imposed on you in that situation and your ability to cope with those demands. Okay. And so the suggestion here is that young children fail elicited response tasks because they are more demanding in general than the kinds of tasks I've been describing for infants. And so just to describe some of the demands that we think are going on here, when children are asked a question like, where will Sally look for her marble? Uh, we believe this uh, triggers a response selection process where they have to interpret that question, choose to answer it, and select an appropriate response. Interpreting the question, of course, involves linguistic demands. You have to understand the words that the experimenter just said. But there's also a pragmatic component here of what is this person asking of me? Children, obviously, they want to do well. They want to give the right answer. But they may be unsure what it is exactly they're supposed to do. It seems obvious to us, but it might not be to them. They also, there's some inhibition involved. So there's a well-established finding that our own perspective can be more salient. So if they know where the object actually is, there's gonna be this prepotent tendency to want to answer that she's gonna go there and they have to inhibit that in order to answer based on Sally's false belief. And then finally, of course, they have to actually represent the false belief. And so what we've argued is that doing all of these things together is too much for young children and that's why they fail the tasks. This has led us to two predictions, sort of complementary predictions. One is that if we could figure out how to simplify the demands of a Sally Ann task, children should be able to succeed at younger ages. And the second is that um, we should be able to do the flip side, take one of these tasks where kids normally pass very early, ranch it up the processing demands, and they should fail. Right? So I'm going to tell you about two uh, experiments briefly in, in each of these lines. Uh, so this is work that I did with Pepe Seto, who's in Singapore, and René Bayergeant at the University of Illinois, where we looked at whether two and a half year olds could succeed in an elicited response task if we sufficiently reduced the demands. And we reduced two demands here. We tried to make it lower inhibition, and I'll show you in a minute how we did that. And the second is we implemented some simple practice questions that we would, thought would help with the response selection, with interpreting the question, knowing what they're supposed to do, and then choosing the appropriate response. The basic setup looks like this. So we have this storybook where there's an experimenter stands across from the child. She turns the page and either says a line of our false belief story or asks the child a question. In cases where she asks a question, their job is just to point to one of the two images that they see. Right? And so we tested uh, two and a half year olds in this project. And here's how the story goes. It's very similar to the Sally Ann story. Uh, this is a story about a girl named Emma. She finds an apple in a bowl. And then here's our first practice question where we show children two images and the experimenter asks, where is Emma's apple? Very simple. Right? We expect that two and a half year olds know what an apple is and they should be able to readily point. In fact, most of them very rapidly point to the apple. Then Emma puts her apple in a box for later and the sides of this are always counterbalanced. She goes outside to play with her ball and then our second practice question asks them to point to the other side in order to find the ball. The design of these practice questions was aimed to help them interpret a where question 
because that's what they're going to hear in the test trial, right? Where is she going to look? To realize that what they're supposed to do is point to what they know the answer is, because that might be pragmatically sort of unclear to children, and to practice picking from one of two locations, because that's what they have to do in test. All right, here's where the false belief happens. Her brother Ethan shows up, finds the apple, and takes it away. And this is what makes it a low inhibition task, is rather than moving it to the other location, he takes it somewhere unknown. And so in the test trial, the kids don't know where it is, so it's less potent to try to answer based on that. Their own knowledge is going to be less salient. Emma then comes back to look for her apple, and children see this test trial. They see the two containers that the apple has been in over the course of the experiment, and they're asked, where will Emma look for her apple? Does anyone remember where the apple was? Okay. <laughs> Do so many talks of this with different versions and I never remember anymore. So if they followed, right, they should expect her to go here. Um, and since they don't know the true location, if they don't follow the false belief, we expect there'll be a chance that they'll just point randomly to one of these two locations. And so here's what we found. This is the percentage of children who pointed to each of the two containers, right? The correct is the one that's consistent with her false belief and the incorrect is the other one. This is the overall sample on the left and then I've just broken it in half, right? With a median split on age. So you can see that there's no difference dependent on the child's age. And so almost 80% of the children point to the correct container. This is significantly greater than chance, right? So with these very simple manipulations of introducing the practice trials to help them understand the question, and removing the object from the scene so that the inhibition is lower, we've taken the age of success from at least age four down to two and a half years of age. So a really dramatic reduction in the age at which they can pass with these very simple changes. And so I think that this pretty strongly shows that their performance is very much dependent on these processing demands. And so when those demands are reduced, they're able to succeed at a much earlier point in time. Now we've always argued that all of these different kinds of tasks that people use to test false belief understanding exist on a continuum from it's super easy for you to do this to super hard, right? And if that's true, we should be able to take any one of them and manipulate the processing demands and see success either improve or decrease depending on what exactly we've done. And so to test that in a recent paper that I conducted my graduate student, Aaron Roby, we tried to do the flip side where we take a task we know children pass and we increase the demands and see if now it impedes their performance. Okay. Uh, the task that we use is one that uh, I have published before, a preferential looking task. It's actually one of the tasks that we use in our work with Clark. So this task is based on the idea that when viewing a scene, both children and adults have a tendency to look longer at images that match the sentences they hear. And so the basic idea, we tell children a false belief story Right, somebody has a false belief about the location of an object. At the end of the story, they see two images like that, one that's consistent with the person's false belief and one that is not. And if they follow the story, they should look longer at the belief consistent image. And that is, in fact, what we see in two and a half year old children. Right? So then we took this task that two and a half year olds succeed in and we manipulated a processing demand, specifically the linguistic ambiguity. So we presented children with a false belief story that either did or did not contain some amount of ambiguity, the reason that that ambiguity might increase the difficulty and impede their performance, and that their ability to cope with that ambiguity would be correlated with their verbal skills. So here we tested three-year-olds. We measured their verbal ability using the MacArthur uh, CDI level three. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this, but it's a basic parental report measure that consists of a checklist for vocabulary, questions asking about children's syntactic competence and their semantics. So do they understand that a horse is bigger than a dog? So understanding concepts like bigger and left and right, right? So that was our measure of verbal ability. Children heard a false belief story accompanied by a large picture book, very similar to the one you saw in the last study. And we had two conditions here. So the story, again, is very similar. I tell lots of these false belief stories that I get them all confused. I don't know who has what object or where they've hidden it right at the end of the day. But in this one, we have a story about a girl named Mia. And she has a cookie. And it's her grandma's birthday. She wants to give her a cookie. Here we have a two-picture trial where we have a cookie and an orange, and they're asked, where is Mia's cookie? 
Uh, the motivation for this here is different than in the last study. We're not going to ask a test question, so it's not practice, but we are going to show them two images at the end, and we didn't want that to be a surprise. So we worked in a few two-picture trials so that they were aware that that could happen. They're then told that Mia puts her cookie in a blue bag, and then she goes to put on her shoes. Right? And we have another uh, practice trial sort of thing. And then while she's gone, Danny takes the cookie out of the blue bag and puts it in the pink box. So this would be high inhibition because they know the actual location of the object. Then Mia comes back, and this is where we manipulated the uh, ambiguity of the story. So they hear, hurry, hurry, said Mia's mom. We're leaving for grandma's. Mia puts on her coat and quickly runs in to get grandma's cookie. Here we reason there's two interpretations of what happens at this point. It could be that she runs in the room and she just grabs the container that she thinks has a cookie in it and she runs out the door. So she had put the cookie over here, so she'd grab that and she'd run out. And so we call that the false belief interpretation where she's acting based on her false belief. But the experimenter could also mean that she comes in and she looks for and finds grandma's cookie, right? And then takes the container holding it and leaves. And so that case, it would be the pink box. So that's the reality interpretation. And we did a pilot study with adults where they felt very strongly that pragmatically the right interpretation of this story was the false belief interpretation, that she's going to run in and she's going to grab the bag and she, she leaves. Okay? So if children have difficulty with this ambiguity, then they might be uncertain what unfolds at this moment in the story. We also ran a control condition where we tried to clarify that. So here, uh, we, it's the same sort of setup, but we added one more sentence where she says she grabs the cookie and runs out the door. I'm trying to emphasize that she just runs in, she grabs this thing and she runs out. So emphasizing the hurried nature of her actions. And so that should make the false belief interpretation more likely from the child's perspective. Children then see a test trial where they see these two images of an anonymous individual, right? The identity of the person isn't known. In each one, she's carrying a, a container. So this is the container where Mia originally put the cookies. We call that the original location picture. And this is the container that currently holds the cookie. And while viewing this, they just hear there's Mia walking to grandma's. She's carrying grandma's present. And we measure which of these two images uh, they look at during this trial. Given that children and adults have a tendency to look at things that match the sentences they hear, we expect they'll try to look at Mia. Right? They'll look at the person that they think is Mia. So if they've arrived at the false belief interpretation, they should look here. And if they've arrived at a reality interpretation, they should look here. If they're very confused, they'll look equally at both, right? because they won't know which one is Mia. So we coded where children looked during the first six seconds that the picture were visible. And we looked at these raw looking times to each location, as well as a preference score. So their looking time to the original location picture minus their looking time to the current location picture. So this serves as an index of how adult-like their reasoning is. The higher the score is, the more they believed in the false belief interpretation, which is what the adults thought was the correct answer. Our prediction was that in the control condition, as in previous research, when the story was unambiguous, they would have no trouble figuring out what happened next, and they would look longer at the original location picture. But in the ambiguous condition, we predicted that they would do worse, and that their performance would be correlated with their verbal ability. So in preliminary analyses of this, we detected a very strong effect of verbal ability. And so in the graphs I'm going to show you to illustrate that, we've broken it down by vocabulary quartile. right? And quartile 1 is the kids with the worst verbal skills, and quartile 4 is the kids with the best verbal skills. Okay. So here's the control condition. This is the mean looking time in seconds to each picture. Remember, the original location picture is the one that adults felt was the right answer, so the correct response, so to speak, is to look there. Um, and so this is the lowest quartile of verbal ability, and this is the highest. You can see that overall, children had a tendency to look longer at the original location picture, and that was significant. And despite this reversal in quartile three, there was no interaction uh, or effects of verbal ability. So in the control condition where the story was relatively unambiguous, we replicated prior research and found that children were able to follow the story and looked longer at the false belief consistent image. Now here's the ambiguous condition. 
You can see that here we do get an interaction with verbal ability. So children in the lowest quartile of verbal ability look significantly longer to the wrong image. So they looked longer where the cookie currently is, um, suggesting they arrived at the inappropriate reality interpretation of the story. Children in the highest quartile showed the opposite, so they looked like kids in the control condition. They looked longer at the original location picture, and the two in the middle looked approximately equally at the two images. Um, another way of looking at this is to do a scatter plot of their preference for the false belief interpretation by vocabulary. And so that's what I have here. So you can see there's no correlation of any kind in the control condition, but there's a significant correlation in the ambiguous condition where when the story was ambiguous, children with higher verbal abilities uh, were more likely to arrive at the correct interpretation of the story. And so what we've shown here is that um, just like in experiment three, we could make kids pass at younger ages by reducing the demands. Here we see that increasing the processing demands impedes three-year-olds' performance, suggesting that these things exist along a continuum, such that regardless of whether you ask the kid a question or not, their ability to demonstrate false belief understanding is going to vary as a function of the processing demands of that task and their ability to cope with those specific processing demands. So if I go back to the question I asked at the beginning of when do children understand that others can be mistaken, what I've shown you today is it appears that a robust, flexible understanding of this emerges within the first year of life, but that children's ability to express this understanding is going to depend on other demands of that situation and their ability to cope with those demands. Now, so very briefly, to just to mention some future directions, I'm happy to answer questions about any of these things um, in the question period. Continuing to work on exploring the nature of early competence in a number of different ways. So one is looking at um, more complicated false beliefs that require more rich understanding. So false beliefs like some of these things are fish or most of these things are fish. And more importantly, I'm really interested in looking at within subject continuity. So there's been very few longitudinal studies looking at how this unfolds from infancy onwards. And a lot of this work is between subjects. So we look at false belief about identity with one kid, false belief about location with another child. And so we have very little understanding of how much their false belief performance hangs together within individual across situations. And so with my graduate student, um, we're working on addressing that gap in the literature. I'm also very interested in individual differences in false belief performance. So we know that in adults, uh, there are great differences in people's ability to sort of fluidly take into account other people's mental states on a day-to-day -day basis. Some people are very good, some people are not, right? And so where do those individual differences come from, given that we see this very early developing robust ability in infancy? So we're looking at a number of different factors that might interact, say, with their ability to take into account in a processing demand kind of way or what they pay attention to spontaneously. So one is conversation with parents. So we have a whole bunch of studies looking at uh, the kinds of social interactions that children have with their parents, whether they use mental state terms like talking about what people think and know and how that might influence this development in toddlers. And also a recent project looking at socioeconomic status. So a lot of the children that I work with in the Central Valley are very low income uh, immigrant backgrounds. And so we're looking at whether those children differ at all in their early false belief understanding. Finally, I have an ongoing project that is ever so close to being done, <laughs> looking at false belief understanding in autism spectrum disorder. So there's a well-established finding that children with autism spectrum disorder have difficulty with typical false belief tasks. And the question is, is that because they have a hard time representing false beliefs? Or in light of this work with infants and toddlers, could it be that something else? We know they have poor executive function. They have difficulties with language. Could that be why they fail these standard tasks? So in work that I've been doing uh, with Melanie Glenwright at the university, uh, in university in Canada, she is looking at using a spontaneous response measure, again, that preferential looking task with children with autism, to see if in that context you see evidence of an understanding of false belief. And though I don't want to like count my chickens before they're hassed, it seems very positive that we do see evidence of false belief understanding in these children in this kind of experiment. Okay. All right, as I said, I'm happy to answer questions about any of the stuff I talked about today, any of these future directions. 
Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to my assistants, to the people who, who pay me to do this research, and to the parents and children who participated. Questions? Yeah. Just to clarify, so there's a transition where, where young infants, they look longer at things that they, they that don't meet their expectations, and, and then but in later childhood, they look at things that do conform. To their uh, so the difference there is not age, but rather the nature of the experiment. So in the stuff that we do with infants, there's no language. And the stuff we do with older kids that I'm talking about, there is. And so the response is different. There, they're looking for what you're talking about. I don't, you would probably, if the younger children could understand language and you could talk about it, you'd get a similar effect there. So the difference is really whether they're just naturally reacting or whether they're trying to find what someone is, is talking about. Okay. Um, can you answer the Mm -hmm. which American parents do all the time with their kids, right? Yeah. Um, you know, oh, what's that when you both know what it is, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and is that, has anybody done work on that? Do you think yeah. that's a possibility? So I think that's a huge part of why children do or do not succeed in these tasks across cultures at any given age. So um, there isn't a lot of empirical work, though I have a strong belief <laughs> in the truthiness of that. There is some work by Michael Hansen that he has argued that this question is very pragmatically bizarre. It, you're asking the child to tell you a thing that you already know, and they might think, well, that can't be what you mean, right? You might mean, where is she supposed to go? Uh, where will she eventually need to go? If I were going to help her, where would I tell her to go? Like, there's all these other interpretations. And so he's sort of tested them without asking them questions, just saying, describe to me what just happened and, and what's going on. And the kids will often spontaneously go, well, she's going to come in and she's going to go over there because she doesn't know. And they'll do that at, like, three um, and he's also then done some where he says, okay, you know that it's in, in here, and I know that it's in here, but where's she going to go, right, to really clarify the pragmatics? And there you do again see success at like three and a half. So I really think that it's not a coincidence that in lots of cultures, the age at which children pass this task is the same age that they begin formal schooling, where we engage in all of this like, now you regurgitate to me what it is that you know about what's going on. And now they pragmatically, when asked these questions, know that's, that's what we're doing. But it's very weird, right, as a behavior. And so younger children or children in other cultures that don't engage in that kind of thing might not understand the question correctly and think, try to come up with a more rational interpretation, like where should she go, right, which makes more sense in this context. So I do think that pragmatics is a big part of why the children fail at younger ages. So the study with the apple and the brother moves the apple, mm -hmm. We did. So same exact story, but instead of taking it out of the room, he moves it. So here we have practice trials that help you interpret the question, but now it's high inhibition. And the kids robustly fail at two and a half. So their inhibitory skills are very poor at that age, and it seems like that just swamps everything else. If they have to inhibit their knowledge of where it's located when answering the question, they can't answer it correctly. One, picking up on the chickens before they're hatched, autism study, right? So, I mean, ethnographically, it, it seems that um, one of the challenges that um, higher functioning individuals with autism spectrum disorder have is um, in their interactions with people, um, it isn't the inability to represent what others know that is often challenging for them. It's the inability to recognize the difference between their own preferences and others' preferences that is challenging for them, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, that others won't share the things that they find right, right. the things that they find aversive. And, um, and that that's often one of the real obstacles. So, so, so uh, Clark has persuaded me that 
arguably it's possible to speak language without any ability to represent others' mental states, right, and, and their, their, their um, knowledge states. And obviously, you know, individuals at the higher functioning end of the spectrum are perfectly capable of linguistic interaction. Mm -hmm. um, but their, um, their social interactions are often full of friction, in part because of this problem with preferences. Um, so I wonder if there's something, if there's an affective component that is a stumbling block there that isn't really tapped by this tradition of research, mm -hmm. um, but that conceivably could be if you introduce not third-party observation, but second-party interaction mm -hmm. where preferences matter. Yeah. So I think that there, for a long time, there was a lot of discussion that children with autism couldn't represent mental states. And I think that's wrong and was one of the reasons why we wanted to do this. I think their difficulty lies elsewhere, right? It's not in the inability to represent at all, but rather in attending correctly in an interaction. I need to attend to what you like, not what I like. And I think that if people were to systematically vary, you'd see that that's really where the problem is. And so the reason they can succeed in this task is it's very neutral. It's just where is she going to look for an apple? And there's, you're not asking them anything in particular. And so they, can de they are slower. So we see a time course difference between the typically developing children and the children with autism in this task, regardless of whether the agent has a false belief. So just all the processing associated with language is slower. But otherwise, they, they show the same sort of looking patterns. So, but I don't think they have to worry so much about that in this case. So it wouldn't surprise me if we made this, we could implement a conflict between what they would want, say, in this situation and what the agent actually wants, you might get exactly that, because they're attending to what they want, not what somebody else wants, and then they will fail again. Yeah, I think that would be likely. Yeah. So my second question, in terms of your overall strategy of either um, reducing the cognitive demands of some of the tests that children typically only pass at later ages, or increasing the cognitive demands of tests that they pass early, um, uh, I wonder if you've entertained another possibility, which is instead of changing the features of the ta task, changing the features of the subject. Um, uh, and um, it's clear that when, with regard to <coughs> measuring children's performance in an academic context, um, there are big effects of relatively small manipulations. Um, so giving the kids a snack before they take a test mm -hmm. um, greatly enhances their performance. Having them run around the playground before they take a test enhances their performance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, kids like sweets, um, if you can show that you can lower the age of some of the demanding tasks just by giving the youngsters a treat right. before they perform the task. So that they have then, more attention or interest or right, whatever. Right. Yeah. Then, then um, it's not... Um, because th their previous failure is not because um, it is beyond their capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, it's because uh, the resources that it takes to solve the task are difficult to marshal simultaneously. Right. So mm -hmm. if a child performs better on a, on a school test because they, my, my wife, when she was an elementary school teacher, used to give them hot chocolate before they took the <laughs> tests, and she had the best performing kids in the school. <laughs> Caffeine and sugar. They, her, her children didn't know things that they, you know, they didn't demonstrate knowledge on the tests that they didn't have before they drank the hot right, chocolate. Right, right. Their capabilities were there. It's just that their performance was enhanced by the drug, as it were. Right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, Let's not call it that for the IRB. <laughs> like, <laughs> There's no reason you couldn't do the same in this context. No, I think that's really interesting. I'm actually not familiar with those effects, but I think that's a really interesting suggestion because you're right. Either they have the knowledge when they come into the room or they don't. And so what we're trying to argue is we manipulate the demands and the knowledge is revealed. But this would be a really different, in, interesting different way to manipulate their state such that they are more or less able to interact with the task. So I'd love to see if there's any citations or anything on that. That would be, that would be I mean, great. In the educational psychology literature, yeah. this is a pretty well-established yeah. thing. Um, uh, so much so, even time of day effects, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, pretty substantial, um, I can't remember now what they are, but they're, they're age-dependent time of day mm -hmm. effects. Where there, there's an optimal time to, to have your kids take the test. And right. if you know that, you, yeah. know, you can 
It would be really fun to do that as part of the within subject thing that we're planning where we bring them back multiple times because then you could do the manipulation on one day and not on another and show within the same child, like, do you get the same performance yeah, or not? Yeah, your participants are going to complain if they get a lot of Yeah, well, the IRB will, so that's, that's really the, the trick, but convincing them to let me give the child goldfish crackers or something yeah, exciting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have a thought? Well, just building on that, I'm wondering if also the kind of preschool environment that these kids have, because some are probably going to have almost no, you know, mm -hmm. they're in sort of like a home daycare situation. Mm -hmm. let's, say, let's say they're all in daycare or something, right? But you have some that are going to be um, more focused on verbiage than others. Right. right. Then, and, and it seems like all these studies now are saying, like, it's all about how much, you know, how many words mm -hmm. these kids are exposed to on an everyday basis. And I would think that some of that stuff also, even if their own verbal ability, even if you control for their own verbal abilities, right. that maybe just the exposure constantly to these kinds of situations mm -hmm. that are going to occur more. Yeah. So I are. don't collect data on whether they're in preschool, but that's a really good suggestion. I mean, that would be a really simple checkbox to add to a form um, that I think could predict this. Uh, I, I think that you probably have more exposure, right, when you go to preschool to interactions involving you're fighting with Tommy over, you know, a truck or whatever. There's lots more opportunities for that. There is an effect of siblings. So if you have, the more older siblings you have, the younger you pass that elicited task. So I do think that's for a similar kind of reason, I right? I think it's also, I mean, it, both in preschool and then old, to older si to siblings about their younger siblings, I think you're also often thinking, how would you feel right, right. You know, if we hit, you know, somebody smacked you on the back right. of the head? And how would you, like, that's totally how they resolve stuff, at least in my son's preschool, is like trying to get them to, to understand yeah. the perspective of the other. So they're just like forced into thinking about mm -hmm. this all day long with these little like microaggressions. And then I feel like that's often the parenting strategy people use too, like don't hit your sister. Yeah. Like, it's just like a, well, that's part of the, so the social input stuff that I'm doing with my graduate student is looking at, there's been a lot of research with older children, so four, you know, I say older, I mean four, which as I said is ancient to me. Um, so a lot of research with four or five-year-olds and the amount of talk about other people's mental states that they encounter either from their siblings in their own talk or from their parents uh, predicts their performance on elicited tasks. And so I think that's sort of not about the elicited task, it's about the extent to which your environment draws your attention to these things spontaneously, because a component of success in any of these things is do you attend to people's mental states? And we create situations in the lab that are highly constructed to direct the child to pay attention to exactly that and nothing else, but in real life, right, that's not the case. So I think that correlation between the kind of environment you have and the interaction should show up at younger ages and other kinds of tasks to how readily you spontaneously attend when we don't so tightly constrain the situation. So we have a task with two and a half year olds that's a looking time task where we have parents engage in a little play interaction and we look at the child's mental state talk and the parent's mental state talk. And at least for the parents, we don't have the kids coded yet you see a correlation between how often they refer to mental states in this interaction and whether the kids look to the correct uh, location in one of these tasks. So I do think that would be an interesting like, additional factor because maybe even if mom doesn't talk about it that much, if I go to preschool and my preschool teacher talks about it all the time, then that should be another source that directs you to tend to this spontaneously. So yeah, we should definitely collect that data <laughs> for the future kids. So this is a really interesting area sort of as a case study in how science works, I think, because right, you mentioned that there's so much work on false belief understanding of theory of mind, and then there's almost more theoretical stuff, mm -hmm. you know, especially after Lucy and Byer John and the um, and it's not supposed to work that way, right? Where the more data that you get the more people are supposed to agree on what's going on. <laughs> and here you have massive amounts of data and really fine grained data. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so many, so many, these tasks have been replicated so many times. Not all of them, but you know that Wellman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And in 2001 already there were several hundred studies of false belief. And so I guess what I'm asking, what, I want, what I'm curious about as you know, you're right in the thick of this debate, um, 
why, what is it about this where you have people who have, and the theoretical debates seem to also be interesting because they span the gamut. Mm -hmm. This is a specialized evolved ability, essentially an innate evolved ability that's a universal to, if I'm not mistaken, C.L.A. Hayes' recent proposal that right. this is a learned skill. It's culturally dependent, like reading. Yeah. dependent on experience, right? And so it's possible to have mm -hmm. really smart people arguing the entire spectrum. So, I mean, what, yeah, I, I sort of, I think fa the false belief area is kind of just fascinating in a history of science kind of way. Um, I mean, I haven't been in it for 30 years, so I want to be cautious in saying I have the answers to all of the problems, right? But I think that people have come at this question from a lot of different backgrounds over the years. So the false beliefs task was invented to test primates. It was not invented to test the development of false belief understanding. It was proposed as a way to get at whether this thing that we view as a fundamentally human ability is in fact fundamentally human. And the first test of it was with kids, not with primates, right? You start with the people and see what they do with this task. And that was Wimmer and Perner, 1983. And so it just came from a strange place. It was a lot of comparative research. It didn't start as a developmental question of this is what adults do and let us work backwards. And over the years, people have then come at it again from is it uh, people who are interested in processing in adults, right, but then want to see how it compares to kids. So I think that's part of it. You have a lot of people coming from different backgrounds with different motivations. And that's un the, the, the way the question started is sort of unique to false belief understanding. It differs from, say, questions about children's understanding of biological knowledge, which have always been very developmental in nature. And, and so I think that sort of shaped the field in a funny way, that it started from that place. I think it also just piggybacks on sort of lots of bigger picture theoretical disagreements in developmental literature. So the difference between people who are willing to believe that infants are competent for innate reasons or otherwise, and people who are not willing to believe that infants are competent, that really endorse very protracted conceptual changes from an older sort of Piagetian framework. And so I think this place has really captured that argument very strongly. It's a place where people get very upset about it, <laughs> right? And so the more data you have, it's just the more people fight. I don't know if that's going to change in like the near future, but I know for every empirical finding that I publish, I get asked to review like 30 theoretical papers arguing about that finding. And so it does not seem to be done yet. <laughs> No one's done chimpanzees, but uh, Lori Santos has done um, rhesus macaques, and they fail. So what they do is actually very interesting. So if a ch if an infant thinks you have a true belief, they expect you to reach where you know an object is. If they think you have a false belief, they expect you to reach where you think the object is. If they think you're ignorant, like you just have no idea, they have no prediction. They look equally at whatever you do, right? So the macaques, if you have a true belief about the location of a grape, they expect you to reach there. If you are have a false belief, they act like you're ignorant. So they act like a baby who thinks that you're ignorant. And so it suggests that they are aware that there's something you've missed, but they don't actually uh, attribute a false belief to the person. Yeah. OK, maybe you said this and I missed it. But so I'm, I'm curious about two things. One is the relationship of sort of linguistic ability or exposure to language and performance on the spontaneous mm -hmm. type of false belief thing. And the other thing, which I think is somehow related to that in some way that only some crazy corner of my mind understands, is I remember from the literature that there was this issue that in some cultures you don't really talk about mental mm -hmm. Like, I guess, Somalia, you don't. Mm -hmm. wondering about a similar question of spontaneous, these non-elicited tests with people from those cultures. But I do think there's a caveat, because in that culture, I don't know how much you go around deceiving people. I mean, it seems like that's all about right. behavior and not this language. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, how, what you do. Right, and right. And presumably both of them. Mm -hmm. So I feel as I threw them all in. Yeah, no, so for the first question, um, the experiment four that I just talked about, 
is the only study that finds any relationship between language ability and children's performance in a spontaneous task, and we deliberately designed it because we expected that to happen. Um, I, just for fun, I, I collect basic vocabulary data on any kid I test, and I've never seen a relationship in an infant between their verbal ability and their performance on, say, a violation of expectation task. I think there could be in cases where the task is highly verbal, but it doesn't seem that there's a relationship in those spontaneous tasks between your verbal ability and just your ability to represent the belief, right? It may help you cope with other task demands, but it's not tied to the belief representation. Um, there are effects showing that in cultures where there's less discussion of mental states, right, the, the, so the Samoa, is one that's often discussed. Uh, they do less well on elicited response false belief tasks, and not just false belief tasks, like tests of emotion understanding. Like they just are do more poorly on these different tasks. What would you see, right, in a spontaneous task? I think that might depend on the spontaneous task. Because we do see some effects in our lab where social input affects children's performance on the spontaneous tasks. But it's in a very particular kind where they have to anticipate what someone's going to do next. All the things I've shown you today are post hoc, right? I'm showing you someone doing something that's either consistent or inconsistent with their mental states and the children have to recognize. And there we haven't seen any effects of social input on your ability to detect congruency or incongruency with mental states. But if you have to predict that seems to depend more on uh, the discussion of social in, the social input in their environment. So if I were to guess, I'd say that if I were to do tasks in those cultures, there would be spontaneous tasks where you'd see no difference because the basic capacity to represent is present, but attention might differ, and so that would show up maybe in some of these anticipatory tasks. Yeah. I was just going to, just following up on that, I mean, we didn't really discuss it in the paper that you and I have together, right, where it's... Hmm. Right, and so that's an example of a, a post hoc task where we see no difference in the babies, right? Right, and I mean, it's, it, is an, it is a part of the culture area. Mm -hmm. Where there's less discussion. Is supposed to have norms of not talking right. so much about people. Right, right. Yeah. And they're, I mean, we're no different. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so um, uh, I'm trying to leverage the, the, the point that you just made that verbal ability doesn't And maybe this is already one of the boxes that you check in terms of your you know, sort of background interviews about the kids. But um, uh, it seems to me that, and, and the fact that their verbal ability doesn't matter is a, is, is a perfect control for a confound for this prediction. It seems to me that um, uh, the extent to which parents read stories to children should predict their performance on expectation. And it's not because it's enhancing their vocabulary, which is one of the things that, you know, mm -hmm. an existing literature on. Instead, it's that, you know, stories. Um, which, although there were no books in the ancestral environment for humans, there was a lot of storytelling. And, right. Uh, you know, probably, you know, the, the fastest way to get, you know, to acquire information about social dynamics is not to watch people, it's to listen to the stories, mm -hmm. because, you know, um, a small number of people can tell stories about many, many people. Um, uh, the stories always involve mental states, right? Right. And, and uh, so, if there is no difference in the role of um, the children's vocabulary, but there is a difference as a, fu as a function of having listened to more stories, then it's probably because the stories are giving kids mm -hmm. more opportunity to exercise that capability. Yeah, so that's something um, we've recently begun in this project where we're examining, say, individual differences in your environment. We have a uh, children's literacy questionnaire that the parents complete where they talk, it asks about how many books are in the house, does your child like engaging in shared reading, do you engage in shared reading? And so I haven't analyzed that data yet, but that's one of the reasons we included that is because storytelling, it involves um, not only just talking about mental states, but there is a lot of sort of the narrative arc. So what happens next is also part of that storytelling process. And so that is one thing we have, but it is also all print exposure, right? I, I don't have any assessment of do you just tell stories in your house, right, that doesn't involve reading. But we will at least have that children's literacy questionnaire that we can look at for those kids. Good.